welcome to Cities on the Frontline. My name is Frances Guesquier. I'm the practice manager for the Urban Development and Disaster Risk Management Program of the World Bank in the East Asia region. Today, we'll have three guests provide their perspective on the concept of community resilience. Before we start, as is now a tradition, let me remind everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for the conversation today. The purpose of these global webinars is to have open and honest learning conversation between practitioners in cities and government and partners supporting those entities. The calls are not on the record, so we ask that you not attribute any comments made today unless you have uh, the permission uh, from uh, the various speakers, and we're happy to facilitate uh, these requests. We have more than 400 people registered for this uh, for the call today. So to facilitate the discussion uh, at the end after the presentation, we ask that you uh, put your question in the Q and A function of the WebEx. Uh, please note that the recording of this session, as well as the PowerPoint presentation, uh, will be posted online. Uh, next Monday. Lauren, over to you. Thank you, Francis. And it's great to see everyone uh, on the line again tonight. Tonight's session is going to focus on community resilience. Community resilience, we posit, is an untapped opportunity for economic growth and long-term investment security. The private sector, which is increasingly being driven by social responsibility goals, as well as the SDGs in recent years, has um, really prioritized more community investments. So cities, we find, can benefit from those partnerships with the private sector if they're advanced with transparency and mutually beneficial priorities outlined. So tonight, we're going to hear from three different speakers with very different perspectives. We're going to dive into really specifics with a private sector representative, an academic, and an urban resilience practitioner on how we can most effectively establish the kinds of long-term community resilience partnerships that we need to advance shared goals around the world. And so we're going to be talking about what makes it worthwhile and even essential for the private sector to help advance leadership and investments in this way. Our, our first speaker tonight, uh, I'll have the privilege of having a conversation with her, is a board member of ours and the Global Social Impact Director at CEMEX and the co-chair of the Arise Private Sector Network on Resilience. She will need an introduction, um, not to many of you, because I know she's a very familiar face in this space. Martha Herrera Gonzalez, we're so glad that you're with us tonight or your morning in Mexico. Um, a little bit about Marta. Her passions include social impact, resilience, and transformation, and she has been part of the CEMEX family for 25 years. There she's leading national and international engagement with organizations and including uh, our uh, Resilient Cities Board. She is a board member of dozens of organizations um, and also has received numerous awards for her social work for the benefit of society. So we're so happy to have you here, Martha, and I'm looking forward to our conversation in just a minute. Um, after our conversation, we will be hearing from Professor Duncan Shaw. We're happy to welcome you back, Duncan, from the Operations Research and Critical Systems uh, Center at the University of Manchester. Uh, you're also, as we've said on previous sessions, an honorary professor in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Unit based in the School of Arts and Languages and Culture. Um, you have done a, a number of different kinds of resilience work, working on the ground with cities in our network, including Vancouver, Ramallah, and I'm sure that's going to come up in tonight's conversation. And members of this um, session tonight might be interested to know that you are currently working on an ISO standard on recovery, renewal, and resilience from COVID-19. So hopefully we'll hear more from you on that as well. And then 
last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from uh, our city's own Stuart sarkozy Banoxi, who is our Director of Strategic Partnerships and an advisor for North America. He's held numerous positions in the Resilient Cities family and also served on President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force um, as part of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, Stuart is also a senior advisor on the Global Island Partnership, a member of numerous advisor of advisory committees around sea and oceans. Um, and he is also, for those who don't know, a masterful storyteller. So I'm sure that we are in for an interesting uh, dialogue this evening. So now, without further ado, I do want to turn to the conversation with Marta. Marta, as <laughs> it's so wonderful again to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Lauren. Thank you Lauren. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon good night, and good night. Good night. Greetings from Greetings Mexico. From Mexico. <laughs> It's wonderful to have you here as we were commenting just before this panel. It's been a very exciting week or weekend uh, in Mexico with the elections, and we're so glad that you could make it here with us tonight. Um, as CEMEX Director of Global Social Responsibility and a really top professional in this field, can you give us more insight as to what the value and importance that corporate social responsibility plays for communities today, and, and how is that changing in the business world? Thank you, Lauren. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, for me, uh, CSR is a way of being and a way of doing business. It's a, it's a management concept through which uh, companies are accountable of our impacts and our aims to integrate social and environmental concerns from all the stakeholders into our own business model. Um, it, this should start from the inside to the, to the outside out, uh, aspiring to inspire actions uh, with all the stakeholder, stakeholders, especially collaborators and uh, communities. Um, it's generally understood as being the way through which a company first create awareness of its social, environmental, and economic impacts and, and develops actions that increases the positive ones. It also develops uh, an ethic and transparent behavior respecting, of course, uh, human rights. And, and um, it's all uh, assuming uh, um, their role, their responsibility, and especially the commitment we have. Uh, for those unfamiliar, for example, with CEMEX, uh, this company has uh, uh, been founded for more than 115 years ago, and we are currently operating in, in 50 countries around the world. And the most important thing is we have a, a very clear purpose, which is to build a better future by the provision of uh, um, developing materials and solutions that improve the quality of lives in cities and, and communities. And we have uh, within our uh, sustainability uh, model, a very focused uh, social impact strategy that focusing on uh, um, uh, contribute uh, to our license to operate, to have a positive uh, experience with our stakeholders, to generate share value and to strengthen our brand. So we do this by pursuing this purpose that I'm talking about with three main practices that I think is very important to mention. In social and environmental innovation, cross-functional collaboration and cross-sectoral collaboration, um, and good governance. So for 20 years, we have embarked on this purpose-driven journey that for me is key to achieve this commercial innovation and positive impact and to have a clear commitment with the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. I think that that is really a testament. Thank you, Marta. The, the way you explain that kind of investment is multifaceted. And one of the questions that I hear quite often is, is it a reality that this kind of investment actually brings about more business opportunities? Is it really bringing about job creation? Um, and, you know, are there a specific type of investments that you think are more effective in this space than others? Well, yeah, um, we we are sure, um, and we ha we have lived like like this um, uh, for the long run that 
without local economic development, there is no business opportunities for our companies. And uh, that's why our sustainability models and specifically ours uh, has very clear priorities and very ambitious targets. And, and it seeks to create shared value focusing on a specific pillar. That's the way it should be focusing. For example, we, we focus our investment on education and building uh, skills. Uh, we focus our investment on sustainable and resilient infrastructure and mobility that is very uh, well connected to our core business. We focus our investment on innovation uh, and social and environmental entrepreneurship because we want to create economic development in the communities in which we operate. And we focus our investment finally on culture of environmental protection, health and safety, which are key to our strategy. And uh, uh, with these pillars, we want to coordinate and execute social investments. We want to participate in the strategic decisions on social intelligence. We want to generate new products and services. We want to work together with our value chain and we want to expand our influence um, uh, on the ecosystems and we believe by by doing business in a responsible ways is highly profitable because companies uh, and 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 I, I'm sure you can uh, uh, be agreeing with me cannot succeed in an environments when we are not investing in communities and that's that's why um, uh, in the last 20, last years, 20 years we have we really have really focused on developing, on developing business models, business models that really uh, develop, uh, develop. Uh, uh, community uh, very focused on our uh, our own business and core business agenda. In in terms of where we are today, Marta, uh, having dealt with COVID nineteen and and the virus for the last year plus, um, how would you suggest that companies keep this kind of work going and position themselves for the future? Well, uh, for sure, COVID has been very hard on us and in, in very different ways. Um, I, I like to keep myself positive and with hope and, and see there is a, an opportunity to reset and to rethink ourselves. And, and uh, even though the, the impacts on the pandemic has um, hit very hard on, on all the communities, we also uh, need to see them and turn them into the opportunities to, to, to really uh, move uh, uh, communities to a more sustainable and uh, equitable growth that will evolve in the adoption of uh, new working models, uh, new business models to set uh, people at the center uh, of uh, our own strategies and incorporate these big challenges that we have all along the, the globe, such as uh, climate emergency into our business agenda. These changes should, should resort, I think, in, the, in, in more resilient and healthy cities and communities, a more open and cohesive vision that includes urban, social, sustainable housing policies. Uh, as cities and businesses, we have also uh, big challenges like fast urbanization and stressed urban infrastructure, the climate change and plastic uh, uh, contamination, the equality gap and poverty, public health, etc. So companies, we are learning from this uh, systemic crisis to become more resilient and we need to implement diversity and inclusion measures. We need to focus on human rights as a cornerstone of our business organization. We need to review risk management plans. We need to keep working with local value chains and we need to include the lessons we learn in social development programs to, to, to really focus on innovation. And, and, and social and environmental impact. Marta, there's so, so many points that you just uh, just mentioned that I, I want to highlight, and I hope we'll have more time during the Q&A later. To begin with, though, is this concept of this sustainable and equitable infrastructure. Um, and you, and you know, as a member of our board, that this is this is part of the chair's agenda to look at what is this climate resilient infrastructure that is equitable and creates green jobs. And and so many of the of the cities across our network of resilience professionals, as well as the wider network of resilient businesses and professionals, are trying to understand how we couple economic growth and necessary development 
while we're addressing emissions and and specifically around climate change and net zero targets. And, you know, according to a recent report by Swissery, emerging markets will invest 2.2 trillion in infrastructure annually, annually over the next 20 years. And of course, you know, businesses like Semex must see this as a as an cr incredible opportunity. Um, and, and we know that even this level of investment is barely going to keep up with demands of growing population centers. So how do we how do we meet these net zero goals while we're scaling up infrastructure needs? And how does a company like Semex begin to think through this challenge? What, what kind of trends do you think we're going to see in the construction industry in the next few years? Yeah, you're very right. Um, at Semex, we we have been focusing uh, on the climate action, which we think is essential. Uh, we have a, a program that is a, a, it's a, like a macro program called Future in Action, and we have set uh, an array of very ambitious goals for 2030, uh, like the 35 reduction uh, of our net specific CO2 and and deliver net zero CO2 concrete globally to all our customers by, by 2050. So this is a big challenge. Um, uh, we, we need uh, systemic efficiency within our operations first. We, we are focusing on renewable energies for all our operations. Uh, we've, we're focusing on transport, for example, also on carbon emissions, compensations and restoration areas. We are focusing on innovation in, in urban solutions in um, technologies and digitalization. We are also working and focusing on awareness among all our stakeholders. Uh, we want to be a champion of inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable infrastructure that really fosters uh, to increase the awareness among uh, our employees, our clients, our, uh, our suppliers, our communities. We are also focusing, uh, Lauren, and it, this is very important for us, on a strategic multi-sectoral alliances. We, we are pushing for public, private, um, academy, uh, NGOs, uh, multilaterals, um, and uh, global team-related networks, such as uh, UNGC, the Arise Resilient City Networks, CBI, CDRI, and others, um, because we, we really think this is the way to go. Uh, there is a, 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 a huge uh, a re related trends uh, uh, towards um, buildings and constructions uh, with uh, zero emissions, efficient and resilient buildings in the construction sector, the carbonizing buildings across the entire uh, life cycle, trends like uh, innovation, new business model products and services, new materials we, uh, which respond to surroundings, new kind of jobs, um, in infrastructure becomes multifunctional, robots uh, prevalent in construction, uh, 3D printing, 4D printing, very disruptive ideas, uh, wearable technology, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, very exciting. Uh, we need to to balance things and and and, and have this long term vision, but we we fo we're focusing on alliances and and climate change uh, initiatives. Thank thank you, Martha. I think you you really balance there the fact that there's this long term vision, and there's this need for coalition approaches, and then specificity, getting into the sectors and the parts of the market where there's expertise within the organization and driving change along that value chain. And, and I think that along those lines of specificity um, and, and examples and, and how to really get this done, there's going to be more questions, I imagine, as we get into the latter part of the conversation. Um, for now, I'm going to now turn it over to our other two speakers to share with us some specific examples of community resilience from their work. Um, and then let me let me assure the participants that we'll have more time with Marta towards the end. I see some questions that are popping up already in the chat. Thank you for that. So Duncan, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd just like to build on some of the things that Martha has been saying. So 
the presentation I'm going to talk about is uh, community resilience and how do we build those capabilities in our communities and organisations and the, the profit and private sector organisations um, that exist in communities are just so central and so important to that. But uh, we've been doing a piece of work at the university thinking about um, how we deal with this issue of community resilience and how can we operationalise it in, in a project that's funded by UKRI. So I'd like to firstly talk a little bit about um, why we think that this renewal of community resilience is important. So during COVID, we saw our communities as being our first line of attack or defence um, against the crisis. So we've seen communities have really given us um, very clear answers to some of the challenges, some of the risks, some of the vulnerabilities that have existed in our communities. They've created their own capabilities. They've created Facebook groups. They've created um, different ways of delivering food, of delivering medications, of supporting each other socially and, and different behaviours have been emerging. But COVID really gave us clarity about the capacity and the capability of some of our communities to be able to operate very differently to how we thought they were able to operate. They have um, really stepped up to the task um, across the UK and across the world in amazing ways. COVID also changed mindsets. So it's helped us to um, understand that our communities can be this first line. They are the people who are affected by emergencies, by crises, um, by changes in, um, in risks and vulnerabilities. And because of that, they're able to respond um, in a very local way to some of the challenges that they might experience and foresee. Um, because of that, local government um, begin uh, can begin to think about how to nurture that. And we need to act now about that, because obviously, as, as we begin to emerge out of um, of some of the major impacts of COVID. Um, we can see that um, fatigue, politics can sometimes get in the way of continuing some of the excellent work that's been done. And so we're really thinking about how do we start to capitalise on these changed mindsets that communities are so central to our resilience and that it's not all just about local government. Or, or other parties who are going to come and save communities. Um, there is very much a, a co-production here that's necessary. Um, but local government are important um, because that helps to set um, expectations um, in terms of uh, implementing what national government can set. And disasters are owned by communities, as I said earlier, and so they can be supported by local and national partners. Um, the, um, some of the other communities um, Sorry, um, some of the communities are, are not in the same place. They all have different capacities. They've got different um, motivations, different enthusiasm. Um, they have different agency and ability to deal with some of the challenges they might experience. So we really need this um, whole system to be cohesive. And as, as Martha said, organisations are so central to that. So people really like this idea of community resilience, um, you know, cherish communities, supporting each other's empowered communities, taking responsibility and, and having the ability to direct their own future. And so we talk about communities as individuals, so people living at home, organisations, as Martha's just excellently um, outlined, the community groups that we can see um, and these collections of individuals, collections of, around certain um, interest groups. And, and then associations, so associations of all of these different types of um, parts of the community. But very often community resilience gets boiled down to volunteering. And, and this is partly because community resilience is so difficult to pin down, we think. It's difficult to understand what it is. It's difficult to understand when you've got it, when you've lost it. Um, and, and because of that, we can measure volunteers. We can have confidence that volunteers are there, but we think it's so much more. So we've been changing um, our thinking and thinking about how do we operationalise community resilience? How do we build an infrastructure in our communities that, are, that we can mobilise? And that mobilisation can be done both during um, difficult events, grey skies events, or during the blue skies when we start to think about how can we involve our communities in other aspects of building resilience, building preparedness, understanding risks, and identifying some of the vulnerabilities. So we've been developing um, some steps to operationalise what we call local resilience capability. So local resilience capability are these series of capabilities that local government 
communities and um, organizations all the different parts of communities can work together on they can come around these capabilities and start to develop partnerships co-produce aims as it says um, through one to seven here um, but because time is tight and uh, I would like just to focus on um, just a few of these um, um, these numbered bullet points these steps so one of the first steps is about developing partnerships partnerships and what we've really seen during covid is that the partnerships are just so key and and martha has been talking about that um, as well in terms of establishing who is it that we need to work with who is it we need to support or needs to have support us and we think it's it's a whole range of people the voluntary community sector are there as important partners but to, is to ensure um, consistency across a country, to ensure consistency across a local area, the local resilience partners, local government need to be have an assurance role around this. Um, importantly, when we talk about partnerships, we don't mean everybody. We don't mean every single voluntary organisation, every single person. It's about coverage across a locale rather than complete saturation of everybody. It's almost we need enough people to be able to assure that we can respond or recover. And it's about one at a time. It's not about trying to, uh, to get everybody converted um, or, or to continue their activities. Another um, step is about co-producing aims. So here it's about um, not just top-down delivery of this is what community resilience, this is what local resilience capabilities will be. It's about co-producing those with communities to identify risks, to identify vulnerabilities, and to identify at what level of preparedness are our communities and where might preparedness and how might preparedness be further enhanced, but doing that in ways that communities think are sensible and helpful. Um, jumping straight through to evaluate, how do we know that this system is actually um, available? How do we know that if we want to mobilise in response to an emergency, then we're able to mobilise? And we think that there are five parts of the system that need to exist. Um, we think that um, communities in association with local governments in a co-produced manner need to develop strategy. There needs to be leadership around these um, capabilities. They need to have intelligence around, um, around risks, around vulnerabilities, around the level of preparedness, and that helps them to understand the gap. Um, there needs to be management around governance, plans, assessing the readiness of assets, around education and exercising about uh, there needs to be communication and coordination across different partners, so coordinating both with official partners, with communities, and making sure that different communities um, are, are not um, overlapping too much um, in, in terms of the sorts of provision that they, and to the extent where there's, there's competition, so more complementarity than competition. Uh, we need to get f feedback from the beneficiaries of these systems, and then we need to think about how do we deliver. So different delivery approaches, the efficiency of that, um, giving decision-making authority to that. So rather than that being held nationally or locally, it's, um, it's held at the community level, and then getting feedback. And we see that we can start to assess using this radar char chart, we can start to assess where are our locales in delivering this. Um, just before I, I finish, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what are these capabilities that we're talking about. So we see that organisational volunteering is absolutely key to this and in the way that uh, Martha has talked about. We also see that the spontaneous volunteers that emerge from communities um, are equally as important. Um, I, I, you know, and and the, these two categories include NGOs, um, voluntary organisations, um, and, and just the goodwill of our communities to emerge. Um, we think donations management is incredibly important because um, it, it feels like that is such a central um, component to um, the community effort. Uh, organised communities um, and how communities can organise themselves, both um, with governance and, uh, and with being able to um, deliver what they need to deliver to make themselves a little bit more resilient. We think that information dissemination is really important. That's two ways, information dissemination um, to communities of how to prepare, how to go about this, but also pushing that information about risks, vulnerabilities, preparedness up to local government so that the risk profile can be better understood. Um, we see that community infrastructure and um, guidance around recovery, business continuity, making sure that 
the organisations that are at the heart of our communities are able to respond to events when they happen. And then households, how can they prepare? So we see that these capabilities, um, and by no means is this entirely exhaustive, but um, these capabilities are, are really key to preparing communities, preparing individuals, organisations and so on for the challenges that they might exist. So with one eye on time, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'd just like to thank you very much and uh, I'd like to hand back to Lauren. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, the insights you provided are going to provide very good context for the discussion in a little while. In the interest of time, I'm going to move straight on to Stuart's presentation. Stuart, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Lauren, and really fantastic to be here to talk about this today, and, and especially with Duncan and Marta and the way they've started um, this next section um, about the tool and about digging deep into community resilience is going to be a deeper dive, um, but at the same time, it's an attempt to, set, to, to start to think about how we use community resilience in the form that uh, we've all been talking about today. Uh, and, and spread it out through institutions and then really focus on a finance lens. So uh, my slides are just going to focus on a very specific piece of this work uh, where community resilience and community development finance are the intersection. Um, and this comes from the Resilient Community Development Finance Initiative that I'll talk about in a second um, and, and is intended to focus on a tool that rates lending and financing at the community level while engaging the institutions that do uh, the capacity building and development services and uh, marta started out of a very big picture and you can see that duncan was starting to list off the different pieces that are necessary and so this is uh, like extracting a few of the numbers on his bulleted list and starting to to, to dig deep on it uh, and it's something that's very active right now um, in terms of the the testing of this tool and, and, and I'll spend some time um, going through that and, and, and um, talking about the foundation because when we began this journey, um, we really wanted to say what was the foundation and this is a familiar uh, image and slide uh, to most of you probably. Uh, but what we said to the groups that we started working with was we are really trying to make sure that we're, we're bringing our systems back in balance. And so how do we finance that balance how do we bring back the ability to put the cascading benefits as i'm starting to call them in place of cascading uh cascading effects that come from our shocks and stresses so with this lens that we're trying to bring us back into um to balance using a resilience value that has a financing focus uh, we began this journey a couple of years ago trying to see how we bring in a sector that is pretty active in the United States more than anywhere else in the world, uh, but there are similar institutions in Australia and the UK. And we had many great conversations. Uh, Lauren intimated that I'd been around the Resilient Cities family for a while. And we had great conversations in some of the Latin American countries as we were starting to talk about community finance and how we support at the local level um, from large corporates and the government, but down at the, at the, at the community level as well. So, the specific piece that we're talking about here is a resilience assessment tool uh, for community development financial institutions. And unfortunately, today I don't have time to do the the 101 on community development finance institutions um, as they are as an entity. But suffice to say, they're kind of on that list uh, that Duncan provided in terms of the types of organizations that are at the ground level financing and doing development services and bringing communities together. And what we've done is said. Let's bring that community development sector, which has a strong equity tip of the spear already, and bring that together with resilience. So we've been working on and developing this tool and a guide that accompanies it. And it actually has an origin back in the 100 Resilient Cities program and was funded by Bank of America. And over time, that then switched to the, our partners now on this work at Opportunity Finance Network. But like good community work, we brought this down to the communities themselves and to the community organizations that are involved with us. Um, and so you, we, we ended up creating a technical advisory committee. We ended up creating a cohort of CDFIs and those CDFIs 
are actually those that helped design the tool and have been testing it, which has been the fascinating part because that's going on right now. And you see the list of them, but I should say they represent a cross section of the type of community development financial institutions that exist. There are national, local, um, as you can see, there's a very business focused um, African American um, CDFI with a, an amazing leader who's been part of this whole process. Um, and then Indian Fund, which is a nationwide indigenous organization that's doing lending um, and financing ver of various types. And I'll have to say it was one of the first to take the idea of resilience as a lens and talk about a capital screen and regeneration and revitalization for their communities. So that all came together uh, kind of um, with, with some kismet as we were starting to develop this project. Enterprise partners and, and all the enterprise families, some of you may know, um, work all over the world and are doing incredible work around resilience, especially in the housing sector. Um, and what we did with them is create this tool and then send them out to test it on loans specifically. And so this really gets at what does the community do, both in terms of the private sector and the nonprofit, if we're using a resilience lens to, to, try, to, to try to bake in resilience for this work. Um, one super important point is that this tool very clearly from the community members and from the community development financial institutions was not to be a pass fail screen. And the reason that was important is they did not want to try to uh, push the, um, the, the tool and the measurements and the impact down to the borrower so deep that um, they could not ever do any lending that they normally did because they were already doing risky lending. And so part of this was to make sure this was not a pass fail, this was not a tight screen around every single deal, but that we were baking resilience into the, into the deals. So the first thing we did is we worked on a set of resilience principles. Um, I won't spend a lot of time going through them, but I will mention sort of the headline and you can see the key words there for them. We are focused on number one, ensuring that there's a resilience based process in all of the work that we're doing and that the, the, the resilience based process really brings in the local community stakeholders. And to some extent, this principle at the highest level is a lot of what Duncan was talking about and making sure that it's the right set of community members for the right type of products so that we are not um, uh, ignoring and to some extent getting just lip service to the work of community development and to, to community resilience. Um, the other piece of this is that we want to make sure that we're looking at shocks and stresses. You'll remember the seesaw, the teeter totter. We want to be looking at all of these at the same time and not simply um, looking at shocks or disaster risk reduction, but to look at the community as a whole, especially the equity, social, and, and cultural concepts um, that are so important. Uh, the second resilience principle that we bro broke out um, was about the performance and intended outcomes. And so this is in ordinary situations, but also in extraordinary situations. What we tend to say is the shock moment, um, <clears throat> but this is really the kind of work at the community level that talks about the project itself, the performance and the risk avoidance. Uh, we often say that we're, we're financing and all of us are working in resilience to prevent bad things from happening, but that's very hard in human nature. And so what we're trying to do is embed that in the way that these institutions lend um, from the very start, even though they have their kind of regular criteria. And the third one is a third principle is really the piece that you often hear us talk about. Uh, and uh, and it's it's not um, just just sort of um, um, a science or language that we throw in there. Truly looking at what positive co, co benefits are. What are the impacts to the community and the greater system? And then how do we minimize negative effects? And this is something that for a lot of the community development groups um, was the the hardest step. And you can see in the keywords we really are talking about how we get positive impacts and we look at interdependencies in the system and we do that through community groups who are doing this lending. And so what we're doing right now is we're putting the tool to test. 
Um, and with the principles in place, we've created a set of dashboards and a set of questions. Um, and it's, it's uh, as some of the community groups have told us, fairly reasonable to run through, um, but they have to be able to do this quickly as they look at, at their loans. And so looking at the co-benefits. So these are just a couple of examples of the dashboards um, for uh, various principles. Um, we also have open-ended questions that really get at systemic and community resilience objectives, um, bringing in those co-benefits again. Um, and we also make sure that what we're doing is, because this is fairly new, even though resilience is not in communities and community resilience to some extent is, is age old, we're saying to them, how do we make these opportunities more um, uh, available? And what are the aspirations around this work? And how do we, how do we start to embed this further? So what's next? Um, we're gonna finish the testing. We bring the groups together and start to adjust the tool and the guide. And the idea is, is that, uh, and this is kind of circles back to what Marta was saying, we want this to go from the CDFIs to impact investors, to the banks, to the developers. Um, and already some of the CDFIs have tested this with borrowers who are developers, made suggestions on their loans, and the developer, in one case, five different things that was supposed to be changed about the development of an affordable housing project. And the developer did it with, with little to no, um, the borrower developer did it with little to no complaints. Um, and said, I'm going to do this on the rest of my deals going forward now as I build my affordable housing. So that's the kind of response we're trying to look, look for in the, in the wider sectors. And if you would like to get involved and test the tool or just want more information, um, get a hold of me or Tina, who's with um, Opportunity Finance Network, um, who's now the lead on this. And that's it for me. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, uh, Stuart. I'm sure a few people will be contacting you and I'm uh, firstly quite keen to see how this evolves and uh, maybe we can start using this in some of our program. I, I have a first question which I'm not picking from the Q&A because I know a few people will be interested anyway and it's something I really personally have been struggling with uh, over the, the last few years. Um, in fact, maybe we'll start with you Duncan. Like, and I really like how you really build an analytical framework, right? And, and it helps to think about the multi, multiple dimension of community resilience. So it'd be maybe easier for you to answer that question. But I think it's obvious that community engagement works best when it emerges from the ground up, right? And then you have different groups that, that works, they have their own way of organizing, et cetera. But that only works up to a certain extent. The big question, the elephant in the room for I mean, all of us who are trying to develop, promote this kind of engagement is how do you scale? How do you get to a large program? I once witnessed a, an official in India who was trying to defend himself against multiple NGO who had fantastic program and telling him, well, why don't you uh, give us more money? Why don't we do more community engagement? He said, but you guys are doing great work, but you're covering 10,000 people to cover India with more than a hundred thousand of you guys, uh, and and I just can't afford it, or I, can't, I don't know how to go about it. So, what are your? Can you give us any insight? And maybe we we'll go to you, Duncan, and then uh, Stu. You can you can uh, you can think about that, and then you, Marta. You're doing it on the ground. Uh, tell us about how uh, Summit is is trying to scale its own program. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you. It's a it's a great question. It's also a huge answer um, in terms of how do you scale community resilience. Uh, the, the very the, the glib answer is one at a time. So, um, but that means that you need to have um, sort of the the strategy, the vision, the the understanding of what you're trying to achieve, and. By, by having that clarity of thought, by having almost the tools in the tool bag, then you can start to share that tool bag around. So what we're doing and are going to start doing is developing an international standard around this. 
not with the, 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 the idea of setting a benchmark, but with the idea of sharing, uh, firstly, pulling together international lessons of what community resilience means, and then sharing those to a global audience, both to uh, places that do it really well, but might want to hear about different experiences, and then um, sharing it to places that might still be struggling or in the early stages. Um, I completely agree that um, resilience has to be built from the ground up. But I do think that national and local government have a really strong role to play to ensure that communities are not left behind if they don't have the ability to self-organise or to, um, to, to develop community resilience on their own. And so national government setting um, national guidelines, local government being able to interpret those into a particular community or locale and supporting communities. Um, in terms of that interpretation. We've also been talking about the role of the um, Chief Resilience Officer, the Emergency Planner or, or whoever. Their role can move from an office-based role into a community-based role. So actually getting out and having cups of coffee with communities, having um, those um, very detailed conversations one-on-one -on -one with key movers in communities to help them to understand what is the need to understand risks, vulnerabilities and preparedness. Um, so. I could go on. I could spend all afternoon talking about this, but maybe I, I'll let um, some of my uh, my co-panelists um, to share their thoughts rather than me dominating. Over to you, Stuart. Yeah, I think my answer, because we get asked this question all the time about this work in particular on the tool, it has has two parts to it. Agree with what Duncan said, and that's why we chose the CDFI sector. Because globally, but especially in the States, there is a sustainable mechanism in place. They're financing in various forms. And so therefore there's a return. And surprisingly so to some people, that return has always been there for CDFIs as community development organizations, and they're very much at the ground level. So scale for us, at least with the tool and these kinds of activities, um, is, is related to the scale and the impact that Resilient Cities Network and the World Bank and others are trying to reach, which is how do we continue to kind of bake in things to each deal one at a time, which is part of uh, Duncan's glib answer, but it's not glib, right? If that project that I mentioned that was tested added five different elements that made the affordable housing project more resilient, we've done something. And if we do that housing project 10 more times, and then we have 10 more institutions that are doing that for their type of lending and financing at the community level, it starts to build the momentum. And so scale means starting with this group and starting to, to, to sort of spread out. I had an impact investor of just kind of randomly out of a city um, in the United States contact me and say, I want the tool, I wanna to test it with my impact investing deals. Great, let's move a little further into that sector. And so I think it's, it's incremental and in this case, there's a sustainable sustainability max mechanism behind it that was already based in equity. So post COVID, it was almost an ideal transition into this work and that is helping us scale it. And I think will in the future. It's a very good choice we were discussing before uh, the start of the, of the talk. And indeed, I think one, one element is how do you create and scale this kind of program? The other one is how you maintain them. Uh, a lot of our studies show that, you know, very often once the sponsor, once the link with local authority disappears, even if this program were fantastic, they tend to disappear as well, unfortunately. So I think there's really different pieces to this equation, but we can all agree that uh, it's one at a time. Over to you, um, Marta. You work one at a time. Uh, tell us. <laughs> yeah. How it I, is I, I agree. I agree completely. I, I think. Uh, one of of um, of the the best examples that I, I I can give is to really understand the whole ecosystem and um, and uh, in though in that ecosystem on really focusing on the on the gaps of the ecosystem and bringing others into the table. I mean um, other players, uh, investor, uh, impact investors, the, the the different levels of government. We, we work in the three different levels. We work micro, and, and, and I agree, we need to continue strengthening and, develop, and developing skills at the local level, at the grassroots level, 
uh, focusing on how to develop more grassroots organizations and develop skills on citizens so that they can really handle the, their own future. Uh, because that's the way we have uh, uh, been having through time um, and see the development of communities in, in, that, in that aspect. We need to continue working with local governments, with uh, uh, state governments, and with the federal government. And, and uh, the, the, the chief resilient uh, officers or, 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 or other members of, of, uh, of the governments really working together uh, because it, it makes business sense on this. Uh, uh, being pre proactive and preventive, it makes business sense for corporations, for governments, and at the at the macro level, we need also to work with uh, multilaterals, um, making sure that we are um, uh, focusing on the frameworks we we have, like the Sendai framework, which we we focusing on, uh, uh, because it it means saving lives, it means uh, uh, saving money, it means um, focusing on uh, on uh, strategic infrastructure. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so we need to 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 balance and work in in these three levels to understand the whole ecosystem, to bring others into the table, and 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 to work um, in those focus areas, uh, trying to come up with as as uh, Duncan and as Stuart mentioned in 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 a specific um, uh, proposals that that makes this. Um, uh, uh, scalable and replicable uh, around the the whole uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Marta. I think uh, Lauren, I'll pass on to you for the next question. If you're still there, we were experiencing problem with Lauren. Lauren, you're on mute. Oh. Fortunately, my internet is a bit patchy, Francis. So I'll let you take the next one. <laughs> Okay, well, then let's build on this uh, and, and, and talking about sustainability. So we talked about how do, you, how do you initiate, how do you maintain, how do we then try to, to make sure that systems continue? I mean, I, I remember one very impactful World Bank studies where we looked at our program, a very critical eye, and we observed fantastic work from NGOs from local government, some self-organized community group all around the world. I think they were, we analyzed more than $4 billion of community engagement program. One of the key conclusion was that unfortunately, once, unless a sustainable financing mechanism is created and a link to local authorities, even if this link is very weak, most of these programs disappear after five to 10 years. And so what can be done to try to maintain this? And maybe we can follow the same order uh, to you, Duncan, and then uh, Stewart, and then Marta. Sure, so how do you maintain community resilience? I think it depends on who you talk to. So if you were to talk to national government, then they'd be saying, well, we need to empower, we need to um, give appropriate guidance to local government. As you say, the, the role of the local government here is absolutely crucial. Um, if you're to talk to local government, then it's about having a strategic plan and this being at the centre or, or a, an important component of the strategic plan. And then it's monitoring the delivery of that plan. And that should hopefully, um, irrespective of who the staff are in a local authority at any particular time, it should transcend across different personal interests because it becomes a, a corporate or an institutional um, interest to put continuing effort onto community resilience. If you were to talk to communities, then how do you sustain? Well, I think it's by um, ensuring that um, different individuals are, um, are, are still committed to leading these community groups, to participating in these community groups, to um, following some of the advice that's coming down from government, but that they can also um, have the relationships with government to be able to push that information up. Um, I think Stu and Martha are much better placed to talk about how do you ensure continuity within organisations. So I won't stray into that area. But um, what we've seen um, during COVID is 
a lot of it is about relationships. I think Martha really talked about this, was it's about the relationships that you have across all of those three systems that I've talked about, the national, local and community, so that um, nobody feels as though they're doing it alone. They don't feel as though they're pushing against one another, that um, the relationships are there. If we come against any challenges, then those are discussed and, uh, and those relationships help to clear away blockages rather than to create them um, and, and lower motivation towards this. But maybe I'll pass on to Stuart on that regard. Thank you, Duncan. You want to jump in, uh, Stuart? Sh sure. And, and it relates to a few of the questions that we're getting. And it's, again, a, a, I think part of the reason why, um, and I'll be the first to say, as somebody who appreciates the storytelling and visual elements of, of all of our work more, um, that it's hard to say sometimes that it's the finance, financing piece that's going to make this work. But in fact, the community development financial institutions, and as you can imagine, impact investors, banks, the developers and builders themselves are following a line of uh, a line of investment and a line of money. And so, one way that the sustainability impact collection and monitoring all kind of comes together is that if you imagine each of these institutions in any of those sectors uh, stepping into a project there's financing behind it that we're tracking. And each of these institutions, in most cases, already has a set of guidelines and for years monitors these projects, monitors these loans at whatever scale they are. They might be very small, they might be very, very, very big projects, um, an entire sort of affordable housing complex or a community facility or, or a health clinic. Therefore, what we've baked into a loan for a specific project is intentionally, in our case, brought right into the, the monitoring process. So for some of the newer community development organizations and the financing institutions that we're use, that we're working with, I'm actually helping them put the, the 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 resilience items into their loan policies and into their underwriting criteria so that when as they make the loan, they're monitoring that regularly. Or if it's a very early startup or it's some kind of gigantic project that's just kind of an idea, they know not to dive in right away and they start to filter that and start to look at it and start to push back, which is how we're testing the tool. Um, and that way it's contributing to the sustainability of that organization because they're monitoring it, but they're also contributing to the impact in the system itself because each one of them incre incrementally builds the, the resilience in that community. So it's not perfect. Um, and there are big differences between a large city and a, and a community development lender of some kind or a community organization and say a rural community getting at um, Dr. Brand's question about rural communities, the tribal communities that we've been working in. So we have to take it context by context and bake it in enough to, to, to bring it together so that these community groups are, are supporting the institutions that are there. Um, and this is just sort of the first step in this and we'll see how it, how it moves forward too. Thank you, Stuart. Marta, last word. I yeah. see we're getting to the I, hour. This conversation are always so interesting. It, yeah, we wish we could continue. But anyway, you, you're inside, uh, Marta, and then I don't know if Lauren is there or I'll, I'll then close. Thank you. Very quick. Just, and just focusing on, on companies, and I, I guess I mentioned it. It, 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 it could be sustainable because it, it makes business sense. I mean, uh, companies should focus on what's key and material for them and, it, and, and, and their main stakeholders. So uh, by that, and to make it sustainable, companies need to identify the priorities of their own business and uh, together with the stakeholders co-design these um, uh, uh, um, alliances and these initiatives uh, to, to have a very open and continuous dialogue capacity building, strengthening uh, the supply chain with SMEs, entrepreneurs, and, and really um, focus on um, developing new business models through innovation and share value. This is the way we have been doing it for, for many, many years, and we have uh, uh, done it in, a, in a more than 5,000 uh, communities around the globe, focusing on skills development, focusing on dialogue, and 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 identify risk and opportunities to really uh, 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 developing innovation, products and services, 
and working together uh, in, in, with governments and, and uh, academy and NGOs to really bring uh, um, uh, resilient communities into the ar arena. Thank you, Marta. Uh, let me let me try to summarize a little. I'm not going to give a summary, but what I, what will stay with me right after this uh, uh, this session. You grow community one at a time. I think Duncan uh, Duncan uh, said it, and we we all can agree the role of local government. Right, uh, it, that's I think an important message to our, our resilience officers. Local government have a huge role to play in promoting, in fostering, and encouraging a community resilience. Even if they're not the one who will manage or run these communities. You need this, that supportive environment, and particularly if these communities are to stay there uh, in in the long run. And I think it was uh, Duncan again who talked about the wealth of relationship and how you know people need to feel like they can talk to their public officials at local level, at national level, uh, even if all the work is going to be done at um, at local uh, level, and then Stuart, you you were very clear, and I, I would agree with you that if we want this to be sustainable, we need to embed uh, the concept of resilience in the financing mechanisms. Right? They need they need to be there at the core, and they need to be maintained over uh, the long run. And then Marta, company will support this kind of program. It it has to if it makes sense. If it makes business sense, and I think the work you're doing around the world is a demonstration that uh, business sense doesn't need to be in a position to community um, community resilience and, and community engagement. To the contrary, there are beautiful examples where the two align and communities and, and corporate interest uh, work together in building more resilience. So I'll leave it here. We're three minutes over the time. Thank you so much for your contribution thank you everyone for uh, joining us uh, today and every other weeks in two weeks in june 24 we'll cover a topic that uh, i am very very interested in on which is the, the topic of urban heat i uh, will have uh, some uh, real insights on uh, recent research and um uh, on this this I think growing problem all around the world. So thank you everybody uh, for joining us and have a fantastic uh, evening if you're in Asia, uh, afternoon if you're in Europe and day if you're in the Americas. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye everyone, thank you. Bye, thank you very much. Thanks Francis. Thank you very much. Thanks Lauren. Bye Marta. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye, thank you so much. Talk to you soon, Talk Duncan. To you soon, Duncan.